can do so as well. We appreciate you doing that. Just to make everyone uh, aware, we have Sunday school classes. Those happen uh, every week right before this service. If you aren't attending one of those, um, we'd love to just, if, you, if you'd like a suggestion for which class to join, we'd love to have you join us for one of those. Just uh, a couple of announcements today, this morning, and for this week. Tom is taking a break from taking family and individual portraits as he works on editing photos and putting the directory together. He wants to thank everyone who's participated so far. Uh, he's going to be scheduling another round of photos for later in April. So if you didn't have your picture made this time, be on the lookout for dates and times later next month. Know that um, we have a full schedule uh, on the horizon for new classes coming up for our Wednesday Connections. So if you're interested in getting, uh, sign up for one of those classes, please do so. You can go to our website, tiptonfirst.org, uh, or you can go to our Facebook page and sign up in that way. Um, we do not have youth today, uh, just due to uh, it being Easter and kids coming back from spring break. On Tuesday, we have fitness classes and Club 55 meets this week. On Wednesday, we have our full schedule, midweek communion, Wednesday night supper, uh, and then Wednesday connections. And then Thursday, we have our youth prayer breakfast and fitness classes. And then Saturday is uh, the big one, Club 55's Methodist Market is happening in the Activity Center. So you can come, uh, bring your donations, clothes, furniture, whatever it is that you have that you'd like to donate and uh, bring that to the activity center during the week, this upcoming week, and that, that yard sale or that Methodist market sale is gonna be Saturday from seven to 12. So you can um, go, there's usually some good things that, that you can get, and that's uh, pretty, pretty good. And whatever they don't sell, they donate to Brother Charlie's. And so it's all going to a great cause no matter what. I uh, encourage all to do some spring cleaning and, and check uh, and, and, and donate some stuff to the Methodist market. But otherwise, uh, that kind of concludes our announcements for this morning. I'm gonna invite you to stand and greet the folks around you. Let them know that you're glad they're here. I may... All right, I invite you to make your way back to your seats. Um, before we get into worship, we're just gonna share a few prayer concerns, have our offering, and then get into worship and then the message. So just to um, let everybody know to update y'all, um, we wanna offer Christian love and sympathy to the family of Jeanette McGill, uh, who passed uh, this past week, and then um, her service was yesterday, just had a, a beautiful celebration of life for her. Um, and then for our prayer concerns, um, Miss Harriet Herring fell and broke her hip before a week before last. But she she's been in the hospital and she's got to go. She got to go home this past week. So that's a prayer concern and a praise. Uh, Miss Jeannie McCook was back in the hospital, but is supposed to go home today. Eleanor Giles also had a fall and had to have a partial hip replacement. She's still in the hospital. Judy Cole is in rehab in Sylvester. Uh, Jeremy Hill's mom, Gail Baker, appears to be close to finishing up her earthly race. And we want to continue to be lifting up Ethan Hyde, Dr. James Milner, Jeanette Dickens, Lee Harvin, Sayla Hoffman, and all those going through treatments. Are there any others that we need to lift up this morning that y'all are aware of? All right, would y'all pray with me uh, over these prayer concerns and over this time of uh, offering and, and our worship together? Gracious God, we just come before you thankful that you are uh, a God that when we, when we speak to you, we know that you are not a dead God, you are alive. 
And we celebrate your resurrection today on this Sunday. God, we remember not only uh, your sacrifice for each one of us dying on a cross, but we remember that three days later you rose from the dead. And God, we celebrate our, our love for you, your love for us, God. We wouldn't be here, this church would not be uh, in, in, in this place and we would not be gathered together if it weren't for what you did all those many years ago. And so we just, we just shout your praise this morning and we just say thank you, we love you. Father, we lift up each one of these names on this list to you. We ask that you would just be God in our midst. Uh, be God to each one of them. Lift them up, God. Fill them with that hope that is in the resurrection, God, to help them overcome in every one of their circumstances. Help them to just lean completely into your love for them. We ask for you to just bring your healing uh, to, to each one of them, God, in, in all the ways that you are able and willing to do so. And Father, we, we pray now for this offering and ask that we would just be givers who are generous, who are joyful, and who are faithful as you've called each one of us for the building of your kingdom here in Tifton and throughout the world. Would you be with us in this time of worship? Holy Spirit, would you just fill each one of us anew with who you are, with your presence, and allow us to just see you clearly, open our eyes and our hearts to, to receive all that you have for us this morning and this time. We love you, Lord, and pray all this in the name of Jesus, the risen Christ. Everybody said, amen. At this time, our offering baskets are gonna come around. Our offering basket, so if you would like to, to give in that way, we appreciate that. As that offering basket comes around, I invite you to stand as we worship.
from balcony to turn their head in disbelief. Precious love would taste the sting, disfigured and disdained. On Friday, a thief, Sunday, a king, laid down in Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much for just what that means for each one of us. That you put death in his grave, God. What a, what a power, what an amazing story that we get to share and be a part of, God. We just thank you for this morning, uh, this time to gather, and uh, this time to worship you. Would you just continue just to show us who you are. Lord, reveal your love to each one of us. We pray this in Jesus' name.
Amen. Y'all, get, you guys can have a seat. So if you have your Bible and would like to turn with me to our scripture this morning, it can be found in Luke's Gospel, the 24th chapter, verses 1 through 12. Also, you can follow along on the screen as we provided the scriptures for you there. As you turn there, I'll give you just a moment. Um, how about that worship team? Y'all give it up for the worship team. Thank y'all. They did something different to the sound system. It sounds really good. And then y'all make it sound even better. So appreciate, appreciate y'all serving this morning in that way. Christian's been here since like 6.30 something this morning doing sunrise service and all that. So, hey, you got a lot of energy for being up here that early. So it's good. All right, at this time, I'd like to invite you to please stand once more as you're able for the reading of the scriptures. Listen along for the word of God. On the first day of the week, very early in the morning, the women took the spices they had prepared and went to the tomb. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were wondering about this, suddenly two men in clothes that gleamed like lightning stood beside them. In their fright, the women bowed down with with their faces to the ground But the men said to them, why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. He has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still with you in Galilee. The son of man must be delivered over to the hands of sinners, be crucified, and on the third day be raised again. Then they remembered his words. When they came back from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven and to all the others. It was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary, the mother of James, and the others with them who told this to the apostles. But they did not believe the women because their words seemed to them like nonsense. Peter, however, got up and ran to the tomb. Bending over, he saw the strips of linen lying by themselves, and he went away, wondering to himself what had happened. And this is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. So after a week-long pilgrimage with Jesus, through the final moments of his life, we finally arrive at the pinnacle of the Christian year, Easter Sunday. We've waited with Jesus as he hung on the cross on Good Friday. We've considered what life without his hope would be like on Holy Saturday And now we finally come to the empty tomb of Jesus of Nazareth. I love celebrating this story every year because it is the backbone of our faith. Without this part of our story, our faith wouldn't have very much to stand on, would it? I love that this story never gets old and we can share it every year and every day for that matter. And it would never lose its power because it's this story that has continued to shape my story, your story, and the stories of countless others who find hope and salvation in the message, in the gospel message, in the power of this gospel message. So in all of uh, this Luke's gospel account, and this particular set of verses, one through 12, the verse and moment of it all that hits me the hardest is this line in verse five. Why do you seek the living among the dead? He's not here, but has risen. It is the punch right to the gut with the gravity of what's happening. For the followers and disciples of Jesus, they were ready to hang it up. 
They thought the whole thing was over. They'd followed Jesus faithfully, but many of them had already been found returning to their nets to try and do something that would fill the hole they felt in their lives. The fishermen uh, that, that had, had done that for a living, they were going back to, to their old uh, lives, to their old careers, following Jesus. It, what did that even mean at this point? He was dead. See, their friend and the one they believed wholeheartedly to be the Messiah had died the most excruciating death before their very eyes. Some of them had even deserted Jesus at his greatest time of need. One had denied him outright three times. One had betrayed him for a little extra money on the side. But their lives were not what they were just weeks and months earlier when they were all on the road with Jesus, seeing him heal the sick, Heal the lepers, uh, the blind eyes being opened, feeding the poor by miraculous signs and wonders, and even casting out demons themselves. They would have been on top of the world, but now they found themselves at one of the lowest places possible. You could imagine how grief uh, ha had, had caused them to doubt the story that the women uh, came back with from the tomb. They probably thought based on you know, what you had seen that something like this uh, would have never happened to begin with, right? This could have never happened to someone like Jesus. How did he, of all people, experience this kind of death? We thought he was invincible. He was healing, he was doing miracles. The disciples, they, just, they probably weren't okay at that moment. They were rocked to the core. And some of them maybe were trying to encourage the others saying, you know, but Jesus told us he would be raised. But still, there was the matter of when and even if it would actually happen. So it makes complete sense when the women who had experienced this at the tomb begin telling the other disciples about what they had witnessed. They tried to tell them about the empty tomb and about the two men with dazzling clothes. Yet, the disciples totally discredit what the women say. They must have thought them insane, right? What are they even talking about? We know what happened. We saw him die with our own eyes. We helped his body off the cross and placed him in the tomb, a tomb that actually had a very large and heavy, impossible for any of you to have moved out of the way uh, to, to even verify this disappearance. No, 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 we don't believe that. Oftentimes, we find ourselves in the same boat as the disciples, right? Just like the disciples were told this story before seeing it firsthand, we have to wrestle with this story as something passed down to us. How do we know if it's true? How, how can we really believe that Jesus was raised from the dead? Even though Peter rushed to see for himself, we can't do that in the same way. But we can search the scriptures for ourselves. We can seek the living Christ for ourselves and allow him to reveal himself to us. See, there is an explosive truth in Easter. If we allow the sentimentality surrounding Easter to dissipate, the bunnies, the eggs, the chocolate and flowers, they can distract us from the real reason we celebrate Easter. Turning it into another consumer-driven holiday, we have to listen beyond the noise for this explosive truth. And the truth is that an ancient Middle Eastern carpenter was raised from the dead to never die again. If you can hear one thing this morning, hear this. The resurrection of Jesus is something, is, is sometimes considered to be more akin to a fairy tale or a morally inspiring story than a historical fact. But if the resurrection is not a fact, then the Christian faith is empty and pointless. So in his book, What is Christianity?, a liberal theologian by the name of Adolf von Harnack argued that we must hold the Easter faith even in the absence of the Easter fact. But we should not easily accept this statement as the Apostle Paul's statement to the Corinthians is counter to the one made by this theologian. 1 Corinthians 15, 17 directly refutes it saying, and if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. In other words, if the Easter fact is not true, then Easter faith is pointless. 
if we are being honest, it is a matter of faith to believe the account of someone else. But there are oftentimes varying stories around what has happened in the past. Take, for instance, this example. N.T. Wright, another theologian, tells the story of a meetup of two of the world's greatest philosophers. Uh, I'm not probably going to pronounce this right. Uh, Ludwig uh, Wittgenstein and Karl Popper at King's College, Cambridge, on October 25th, 1946. So... Popper presented a paper aimed at dismantling some of Wittgenstein's ideas. They were kind of battling it out. But Wittgenstein interrupted Popper, and then the two began to argue. Wittgenstein would even pick up a poker from the fireplace and wave it around. And rumors swirled around the event. Wright records, from that day to this, the great minds present cannot agree on what precisely happened. Some say the poker was red hot. Others say it was cool. Some say Wittgenstein waved it around to make his point. Others, including Popper, say that he seemed to threaten his opponent with it. The point of this story is to show that even though disagreements about the details of a past event exist, it does not mean nothing happened. N.T. Wright says again, The Christian gospel affirms as the central fact without which there would be no gospel at all that something happened. Of course, we can argue that there is plenty of reason to believe that the Easter fact is true. However, many modern scholars have rejected the resurrection of Jesus, but only because they begin from a place of skepticism regarding miracles. This imposed bias has given many reason to doubt But the world being so vast, is it probable or likely that God has done such things as miracles that you did not have the opportunity to experience firsthand? If a tree falls in the forest and you aren't there to hear it, does it make a sound? Indeed, there is much historical evidence supporting Jesus' resurrection. I want to look at a work of Tim Keller that describes several lines of historical evidence surrounding the resurrection of Jesus. So would you go along with me Uh, just a little while longer. In his work, Making Sense of God, we see that um, when these three historical facts are combined, these three pieces of evidence only make sense if Jesus actually did rise from the dead. So first, there is the fact that Jesus' tomb was empty. Indeed, if it wasn't for the empty tomb, Christianity as a movement could never have gotten off the ground. If his body was found, then there was no resurrection. Keller writes, so historians see the empty tomb as a given. The question is, what happened to the body? If there was never a body to procure after the tomb had been diligently guarded by Roman soldiers for the sole purpose of preventing some sort of grave robbery incident, we at least could understand the disappearance of the body to call for a a reappearance of some kind or an explanation as to how it could have gone missing. But there is none that quite makes sense in light of the evidence and details of the gospel story. Which brings us to our next point in this. Second, we have the testimony of and about the eyewitnesses. In 1 Corinthians 15, three through eight, Paul records that Jesus appeared to Peter, the 12, 500 brothers and sisters at once, James, then to all the apostles, and finally to Paul himself. This was essentially an ancient way of providing uh, Paul's research, right? Uh, Paul is saying, if you don't believe me, go ask the others who saw him. Uh, and, And to add, we know that from the gospel accounts that the first eyewitnesses were women. And in the ancient world, women did not have a very high social status. So this would have been an embarrassment to the disciples almost. Still, we know that, that it is written and recorded as it happened, giving credit to the women, women's part of the story. Even though clearly in Luke's gospel, they had trouble even finding, the apostles had trouble finding their testimony credible until after it was confirmed. This was in part due to the nature of the story, right? In light of all that, we still see that the eyewitnesses, and there were many, were either all clinically insane and experiencing some kind of hallucination, or they were all corroborating the same or similar personal experiences 
of seeing the risen Christ. Third, we can see the impact Jesus' resurrection had on his earliest followers. This is the last point. But what does Keller mean by this statement? He says that the earliest followers of Jesus did not stand to gain riches or fame from preaching the gospel. Quite the opposite. Many preached the gospel at the cost of their own lives. Something motivated them to be willing to spread the message of Easter, even in the face of suffering. The followers of Jesus had a motivation that was out of this world, a motivation which led them into dangerous places. They put their lives on the line, and for what? If the Easter fact was indeed real, it would explain why so many of Jesus' earliest followers felt the need to share the fact of Easter at such great cost. When we water down this message, we're tempted to draw back to personal comfort, unwilling to put our lives, so to speak, on the line. In our culture, we've grown uncomfortable with sharing our faith, but at what great cost would it even be to us in our modern world? A rude remark? Are people looking at us like we're different? I hate to break it to everyone, but we are different. We believe a Jewish carpenter who was born of a virgin sent to save the world from their sins. We believe he was unjustly crucified, died and buried, only to be resurrected from the dead on the third day. There was a reason people gave their lives, and it is because of this, this truth, this fact, this reality. So I'd like to go ahead and invite the musicians to come up to continue to lead us in worship. The worship of this Christ who is alive forevermore. This Christ who was crucified and then three days later came back to life, never to die again. How do we apply this to our lives this morning? I just want to wrap it up in one simple statement. If it is indeed true that Jesus was raised from the dead, this only means one thing. He was and is who he claimed to be. And this requires more than our simple belief to some historical fact. It requires life transforming, obedient faith. I'll ask you this question. Do you have that kind of relationship with Christ today? Have you been raised to new life? If you have, aren't you glad you said yes to Jesus? It makes all the difference. But if you've ever said yet, never said yes to a relationship with Jesus, we would love to talk with you about how you can do that. If that's you this morning, know that Christ stands waiting and ready to accept you right where you are so he can take you and bring you into newness of life for his glory and for your good. Folks, this is the good news. This is why we celebrate and this is why we sing because Jesus is alive. Would you stand and worship with us?
resurrection power of our risen Savior. Go in his love and his hope and his peace. In the name of Jesus. Amen.